Psalm 57 was attributed to King David and described as the Michtam or Song of David uh, when he was fleeing from the face of King Saul himself. Now we know that David hid in the cave of Adullam or he probably went and hid in the cave in the wilderness of Engedi uh, there in that particular cave. Uh, it was located somewhere along the western shoreline of the Dead Sea itself. Now we understand that this psalm and the two which follow have the inscription of the word autokit to it, which means destroy not. This particular psalm has reference to a futuristic time uh, when the remnant of the nation of Israel will be going through the great tribulation. It also has a futuristic reference to it as well uh, about the prayers that they prayed for the protection they asked for God to give them in the midst of this most dangerous time uh, that they're yet to go through. Now this psalm was written by David uh, during a time uh, when his life was uprooted and a time when he himself was displaced. David suffered much under the hand of King Saul. King Saul was a very jealous king over David, and he suffered much at his hand. When David wrote this particular psalm, uh, Saul had already attempted to assassinate him or kill him on four different occasions. Uh, two times Saul came after David uh, with the sword. Another time, Saul told David, if you'll bring me a hundred uh, 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 Philistine foreskins, uh, you'll be able to marry my daughter. And then what he plotted to do was to kill David when David came to him. But David outfoxed the fox. And he went out and he killed 200 uh, Philistines and brought the foreskins to him and went ahead and married his wife and uh, married his daughter as his wife. And then in the last time that Saul tried to kill David, he sent assassins uh, to David's house. And David was able to escape through the window and his wife, new wife, covered for him. To say that David had a lot going on indeed was an understatement. All this came about because Saul was extremely jealous of David. The people had chosen King Saul, but God had chosen King David. And with that being said, the sufferings of David uh, foreshadowed the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ that was to come. And the sufferings of David also uh, foreshadowed the futuristic prophecy uh, where the remnant of Israel uh, would be spared during the great tribulation time known as Jacob's trouble. But let's look, if we can, tonight at the first part of this psalm. It's a cry to God in the midst of enemies, a cry out to God in the midst of the dangers that the people uh, were going through. Uh, in Psalm 57, 1 through 5, uh, we read these words. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, and to God that performeth all things for me. He shall send forth from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Salah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among the lions. I lie even among them that set, fi set, on, are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. But thou exalt, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all of the earth. With that being said, I remind you this psalm and the one preceding it is a cry to God for him to be merciful and for him to be gracious among the people. And here we have the blessed assurance in the midst of evil, in the midst of pain, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of danger and death, the Lord himself is our only refuge for the troubled soul. The songwriter of old sang, where can I go? Where can I go? Nowhere but unto uh, the Lord himself. Such is the comfort of all born again believers. Where do we go when trouble comes? We call upon the name of the Lord. Where do we go when disease comes? We call upon the name of the Lord. Where do we go uh, when troubles come? We call upon the name of the Lord. Where do we go when adversity comes? We call upon the name of the Lord. When do we attack by the enemy? We call upon the name of the Lord. I remind 
given you such is the comfort uh, for all believers. It is the shadow of his wings uh, uh, where we go for comfort today. We find a sheltering refuge. I want you to know it's the shadow of his wings, uh, not the wings themselves that we go to, but the shadow of them which speaks of his gentle, loving tender care. How grateful I am to know that we have a God that has a tender heart toward us. And when we're suffering, He has a tender heart toward us. And when we're going through trials and tests, He is merciful and He is grateful. And I praise God for that. Uh, you know, God does some things for us sometimes that, that's just it's just, it's so cool if you will, what God does. I remember a week ago, I was up in the mountains of Virginia and I went over into the area called Brooks Garden, a place I love to go pray. It's a beautiful crater in a mountain, if you will. It's absolutely a gorgeous place. Uh, to me, one of the wonders of the world. I could live there. It's beautiful. And I was going over that mountain uh, to check on a boat that my dad had over there at the, at the lake where he, where he used to have the boat. And, and I was praying all the way over, God, I want to be your friend. God, I want to be your friend. I bet you for 40 to 45 minutes, that was a prayer I prayed or I was singing to God. I want to be your friend. Moses was your friend. Abraham was your friend. You said you'd be a friend that would stick closer to brother. God, I want to be your friend. And I prayed and I prayed. This morning in the 830 service, there was an utterance in tongues and the interpretation came out with a lady sitting in the back. And she interpreted and started that saying, listen to my servant and my friend. There is no way in the world she could have known that. But God said, listen to my servant and my friend. You don't know what that did for me. My servant and my friend. God knows what we need when we have a need. And he's able to use people to help us and bless us during that time. It reminds us of the words of Jesus Christ when he talked about the shadow of the wing. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou killest the prophet uh, and stone." I stoned them that sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy ch children together, even as the hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and you would not. As God's people, we have a place of refuge from the storm of life. And that refuge is a place of protection in the shadow of his wings until the destruction is overpassed. So saith the word of God. Now destruction, calamity, murder, mayhem, division, hatred, so on and so forth, will continue in this world until we're all gathered home. But I am grateful that we have a place we can run to, a place that we can hide, a place where we can be covered, a place where we know that the great arms of God are around us and caring for us through it all. But as God's children, we will be safe even in the days of calamity. Remember what the word said in Isaiah? Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy door about thee. Hide thyself as if it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. We look at him. All the saint is all the saint should, as David did, as the remnant of Israel will do one day, and others that assurance that he performeth all uh, for us. He performeth all of this just for us, is what Psalm 57 2 said. Now look at verse 3. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up, Salah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. In the midst of all the trouble we go through, in the midst of all the destruction, all the mayhem, of all the things that brings fear unto our hearts and lives, whatever may come our way, thank God I realize we will have a divine intervention from above. The Lord that we serve is not asleep, nor is he slumbering on the throne. His eyes go to and fro upon this earth, and he beholds the good and the evil. He knows when a hair on your head drops to the ground. He knows when a sparrow dies and hits the ground. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me tonight. And I rejoice in knowing that we serve one. Our God is a delivering God. He is a delivering King. He is our Lord and our Savior and another than the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ of glory. He will one day return to this earth in power. He will return to this earth in glory. And on that day, all of our enemies uh, will be under his feet. And on that day he comes, there will be a remnant of Israel uh, that will welcome his returning into this world. The church will be gone, but there will be a remnant of Israel uh, that will be waiting his return. And they said, it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. 
Uh, we have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. God's enemies are our enemies. Our enemies are God's enemies. But those enemies of the people of God, the enemies of the people of Christianity that comes against us, they want to destroy us and dig a pit and bury us in them. But I remind you tonight, brothers and sisters, what the Word of God says. His loving kindness and His truth will be displayed toward those of His own. In the great tribulation during that dark and dismal time when the church will be sealed in heaven and the 144,000 Jews will be upon this earth during that time, they'll be living among the lions. They will be hated. They will suffer. They will ha have all types of persecution. But ultimately they will cry out to the Most High God and He will come and settle them and help them. He comes to manifest His glory over the entire earth. i tell you what, I don't know what kind of a day that's going to be, but I'm looking forward to the day that we go home. And I'm looking for the day that he comes back to this earth and we come back with him. And I'm looking forward to the day that our faith will turn into sight. Look at the second section of Psalm 57. The Bible tells us here in verse 6 and following, they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They've digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they have fallen themselves to law. My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory, awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all of the earth. What a beautiful psalm. Here the enemy is no more. The Lord appeared from heaven. He dealt with them and they plunged into the pit that they had dug for the godly. Think about that. They plunged into the pit that they themselves had dug for the godly. It reminds me so much about how that Haman and his ungodly sons uh, uh, built the gallow for Mordecai and all the godly to die on. But it was Haman and his sons that ended up dying upon the gallow. Let me tell you, the enemy comes to try to rob, kill, and destroy. But his, his days are limited. His days are numbered. There is going to come that day where, the, where, the, where, where life will reverse, if you will. Evil will be punished. The wicked will be punished. And the righteous will have rule and reign with God throughout the ever ending ages of the Lord. So let me remind you, don't be weary in well doing right now. It looks like that the chickens are ruling, or the foxes rather, are ruling the roost tonight. Uh, it looks like that we've got uh, the, 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 the inmates running the insane asylum tonight. But there's coming that day where God said, I've got their number. I know what's going on. It's not always going to be this way. You just keep putting your trust in me. You keep hoping in me and let me hold this thing out because one day it's all going to be reversed and God is going to be glorified in the midst of it all. Again, notice what happened. Their enemies, enemies now are vanished. They are gone. And now they break forth into singing. The singing begins. The praise and shouts for joy. Uh, the groans are hushed. And the heartfelt songs begin. Notice this. The Bible said, the expression, they played their worship music. Uh, they sang their worship songs. And they got up early in the morning in order to do it. You know why? They had something to get up for. Praise God. They had something to get up for. The glory of God indeed will fill the earth. But notice this. Not only will the glory of God fill the earth like the waters fill the streams and fill this earth, but the glory of God will be above the earth one day as well. And I rejoice in knowing that. Now with that background, I want to get to the text of what I want to talk about. And that's this. David said, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise to God. The word fixed in this text stands out to me because of the 783,137 words that's found in the King James Version of the Bible, fixed only appears five times. The word fixed only appears in three verses of Scripture. That's Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 57, Psalm 108, and Psalm 112. Yet God seems to double down on the word fixed. My heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. He says it two times. In Scripture, there is a rule or a law of witness and repetition. 
In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we hear the words that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Jesus said, again, I say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them and my Father in heaven. He also said that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. There is a fundamental rule, if it's repeated in Scripture, we need to take note of what's being said and we need to hear what God is saying because he doubles down on it. He says it twice. Let's look at this. These phrases are repeated in the Scripture. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people in Isaiah 41. Awake, awake in Isaiah. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. In Matthew, Jesus said. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, two times, lay not botch that night, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Seven persons were addressed by God with a double name. Abraham, Abraham, Samuel, a Samuel, Saul, Saul. And in John's gospel, Jesus used the double form of verily, verily, 25 times. When you see this double reference to me with a repetition, it says you better listen to what the Lord is saying. In the book of Revelation, we hear him say, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God said. To every church, to him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. When you see the double reference, I believe we need to adhere to what he's saying. Look at the text again. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. What's he trying to say? It's repeated, therefore, it must be important. My question is, is your heart fixed? If so, what is your heart fixed upon? To whom is your heart fixed? Are we fixed upon our eyes and hearts fixed upon the trouble or upon the solution? Is our heart fixed upon the pain or is it fixed upon the healing? Is it fixed upon the enemy or is it fixed upon the victory? Is it fixed upon the problem or is it fixed upon the solution? We had better have our hearts fixed upon the Lord. We had better have our hearts fixed upon the promises of God. We had better have our hearts fixed upon the things that the Lord has spoken to us because if our hearts are not fixed, if we are not established upon the things of God, we may not make it in this last day. There are too many people falling by the wayside in this hour. Without a fixed heart, it's going to be almost impossible to make it. We're human, and we live in a world that's yet to be redeemed. Uh, problems are mounting all around us, and there doesn't seem to be much help upon the horizon. We better have a made-up mind and our hearts fixed upon Jesus as being the only source of the solutions that we have in this world today. Friends, we're living in the last days. We're living in the beginning of the end. We all have battles to face. We all have challenges to overcome. And we have enemies that we go eyeball to eyeball with on a day-by-day -day basis. All you have to do is look at the Bible and see what I'm talking about. David was a man of God. David was a man after the heart of God. David was a great worshiper. David was a great man. David was a great king. But I'm telling you, my friend, that did not exempt David from pain, from struggle, from war, from mayhem, from problems, from death that was on his heel all the time. I want to tell you tonight, we also know that look at Job himself. He was a righteous man, but he endured more grief and more problems than many humans could be able to comprehend within a lifetime. Sometimes life hurts. Sometimes you're in the pit and sometimes you're in the fire. Sometimes you're on the mountain calling fire down from heaven and sometimes you're in the cave hiding hoping that Jezebel can't find you uh, anywhere at all. There are just some things that happen to us just because we're in this world. There are things that are demonic in nature, attacked straight out of hell and your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The thief come but to rob and to kill and to destroy. Christian, I may shock you tonight with some things I'm about to share with you, but I want you to know uh, that we as pastors and as ministers, uh, we deal with sickness. We deal with grief over the death of our loved ones. We have family turmoil. Uh, we have prodigals in far countries. Uh, we have harassment. Uh, we have nights of tears crying over the needs of people. Uh, we're not exempt to pink slips and foreclosures and, and bounce checks and harassment and brokenness and depression and toxic relationships. We're not exempt from all of these things either. I deal with stuff too. 
Uh, there are times I've got to come to church and put a smile on my face when I don't want to. And there are times I'm ministering to people when I would rather be ministered to. We all live in this world uh, that's crazy. There are days that I long to be ministered to and everything around me looks like it's fixed except for me. You ever been that way? I fight discouragement. I fight depression just as well as you do. I fight devils and there are times I deal with a blast from the past uh, that just rocks my world. As a child, as a teenager, and most of my adult life, I've had felt no self-worth. I have had no self-esteem in my life and sometimes the feelings rise up inside me and I've got to fight in the same way that you do. I fight and wrestle with principalities against spiritual wickedness, against darkness in high places, uh, the rules of darkness of this world just as you do. At times I am in well, weary and well-doing just as you are. And like Job of old, my soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. We all feel that way. And don't you sit there thinking that pastors don't feel the same thing that you feel because we're all in this thing together. We all suffer much the same way. But I'm going to tell you, I have a refuge in my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And we got to run to that refuge and hold on to the hand that's holding on to us. I find my refuge in Jesus. Where can I go? Oh, where can I go? Unto the Lord is where I go. So many Christians are walking away from the things of God because their hearts are not fixed. Are you with me? There are hundreds and hundreds of preachers that are walking away from ministry every year because their hearts are not fixed. There are people that one time said in this church, in any church and every church in Lakeland, Florida, and around the United States, they were one time singing in the choir, teaching Sunday school classes, doing youth retreats, teaching children's church, working in nurseries, you name it, and today they're out sipping their suds because they're bellied up to the bar simply because they've been frustrated with life. Their heart was not fixed. Church members are allowing small things to destroy their faith and wreak havoc in the congregations of many churches today. And too many churches are more like war zones with fighting of the flesh than a place where you can come and worship and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. I don't understand, and I'm just going to be as blunt as I know how. I don't understand how people can come to a church just like this and God touched them and slain in the spirit and on their back for 10 minutes speaking in tongues and go to the doctor, confirm they've been healed and thank God for it and never once again come back into the church building. I don't get it. I don't understand how people get upset when you don't read from a King James Version because that's the version they like. But yet they'll go to a church that uses the King James Version that preaches false doctrine. I don't get it. To me, the heart's not fixed. I don't understand people that say, I was sick and nobody called on me but the preacher. Nobody came to visit me when I was down. I don't get it. If we got a heart that's fixed, we'll give grace and mercy one to the other. Friend, we can find anything to be petty. We can find anything to be angry with it. I talked to a missionary just this past week that sat in my office. He's a missionary to Thailand. And he said there was a great move of God in Thailand. God was moving by his spirit. People were being saved and, and God was moving a great way. But all of a sudden, something happened. The simmers of God in Thailand is split down the middle. It started, he said, she said, he said, she said, and it split the whole thing to kingdom come. And today, in the background, is a sinister voice laughing by the name of Satan that simply said, I stopped it. And what the enemy wants to do is to throw a monkey wrench into the cogs of what God is doing. We have, here have worked too hard. We've prayed too long. We've done too much to allow an enemy to come in and to try to destroy. May I remind you, keep on your guard. Have your heart fixed, not upon people. People are going to let you down. I'm going to let you down. We're going to let each other down. But keep your eyes upon Jesus to know that we will not be moved unless it moves us closer to who Jesus Christ himself is. Beloved, we can find fault with any aspect. Let me tell you, I get calls from other churches and other, other people. I was up in Virginia and I got a call from this lady. She had her bloomers in a wad, forgive me, but 
all upset about something going on in the church that had nothing at all to do with the church. Do you know they moved the flower arrangement three feet from the pulpit? Really? I bet they're going to hell over that, aren't they? Can you believe some of the silly concoctions we come up with that people get angry over? The world's going to hell. And people in many churches around America today are complaining because one's too hot and one's too cold. Don't like the color of the paint on the wall. Don't like the songs we sing or the ones we don't sing. Preachers too long. Let me tell you, I get in trouble sometimes for not mentioning somebody's name in prayer. And the next week I get in trouble because I did mention somebody's name in prayer. It's the honest to God truth. And you know what anymore? I'm saying, look, just grow up and get over it. We're human. I'm going to say things sometimes that are going to make my wife mad. And she'll tell me when I get home because I, that's who I am. We, we're, we're people. We're going to say things wrong. Give each other grace. Give each other mercy. We can find fault with the leaders, with the music, the musicians, the facilities, the yada, yada, yada. We can find fault with people. We look long enough. And the final analysis, do these things really matter? Does it really matter? I'm going to pick on Chris Jones. Don't ever take him serious. <laughs> he will offend you in a heartbeat. Am I right? Amen. That's who he is. Just get over it. Gotcha. Learn the personality. Chris is going to joke with you. And if you're in a bad mood, he's going to offend you. One day we were out shooting. I was over here picking up cartridges. Pastor, would you come over in line and listen to me? I said, what for? I'm talking. I said, well, I'm just doing to you what you do to me on Sunday morning. Just give it back to him. I'm, 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 I'm trying to make a point. Chris and I get along well. Has he said things to offend me? If I let him, he would have, but I'm not going to let him because I know who he is. I know he likes to joke. I like to joke. Let me tell you something else. Texting can ruin us because you can write a text one way and we can read it another. Give people the benefit of the doubt. If you've got a problem, don't go tell the world. Don't go tell dear Abby. Go to the person and say, do we have a problem? Let's fix it. I know how the enemy works, church. He wants to rob and kill and to destroy. But let's have a fixed heart upon the things of God. We need to fix our heart on the things of God, not on the imperfections of man. We're in a battle. It's one thing to battle with the devil. It's one thing to battle with the devil's crowd. It's another thing to have in-house fighting. I've been in churches through the years that split over songs, that split over people wearing gold rim glasses. I, I mean, I've seen it all. And you have too, have you not? It's just stupid stuff. One time a guy graduated Bible college. He went up to the mountains of West Virginia to preach. You'll appreciate this, CJ, but in the mountains, you understand the clothesline preaching up there. He walks in that church, sporting on a, a big, bright shirt, polka dotted tie. He had on a bracelet, two or three rings like me, glasses. He walks in, and they're all dressed in black suits, the men. And the women got on their dresses with the long sleeves, the long dresses, the big bob jobs upon their heads. And he preaches, and boy, he's getting the eye. Uh, and after the service was over with, she, one lady walked up and said, I enjoyed your sermon, but I want you to know your tie offended me. I love this guy. He said, if you see my underwear, you'd backslide. <laughs> That's my kind of guy. <laughs> Friend, we got to have our hearts fixed. Are you hearing me tonight? We can disagree in life agreeably. Satan will never be satisfied until he throws the monkey wrench into the cogs of what God wants to do in his church. Don't be a catalyst to division. Don't be a catalyst to murmuring. 
Don't be a catalyst of spreading rumors. Don't be a catalyst. Strive to maintain the unity of the faith. Hear me and hear me well. Warts, wrinkles, faults and all. It's not always about right or wrong. Sometimes it's just about being different. It's just, Chris is not wrong in what he does. He's just different. I've got to buy him a milkshake after service tonight. Satan is making his last day stand, church. He's bringing in his heaviest artillery. He's using every trick in the book that he can to divide and conquer, to destroy. Who would have ever thought America? Now, we've always had our political divisions, but have they ever been so broadly divided as they are today? Who would have ever thought even 10 years ago that we would be having the discussions that we're having in the political realm where we literally are divided to the point that we want to go knuckle to face over some of the things that we're hearing one side saying the other side. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Where does this come from? And if it's doing it in American culture, he wants to do it in the church. My heart is fixed, oh God. My heart is fixed, oh God, upon you. I've got to hurry. Be like David. Bow down. Don't doubt, bow down to the poison enemy. He said, my heart is fixed, oh God. My heart is fixed. I will sing praise. People that gossip to you will gossip about you. People that gossip to you will gossip about you. These are perilous times. These are wicked days energized by satanic activity. Satan is coming out of his closet with an unholy anger. And he's got your target. He's targeted you. He's targeted me. But as long as the sucker's chasing us, he doesn't have us. Amen? I got to hurry. Don't listen to gossip. Don't listen to innuendos. Don't feel victim, fall victim to Satan's devices. Don't listen to false teaching, no matter how spectacular it may sound. Don't believe the lie that you're different. Don't believe the lie that you're a failure or a has-been. Fix your eyes up on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. When you study the word fix and begin to dig into its meaning, you start to see what David was saying in the midst of his crisis, in the midst of his calamity. It kind of has a connotation of bowing down. His soul was bowed down. You find this man at one of the lowest points of his life. His, inside, his heart was bent down. This year has been a time, since 2020, COVID hit. It's been a time where it seems like the church has bowed down. For my soul is full of trouble, oh God. My soul is cast down within me. David even said, no man cares for my soul. You're talking about a frustrated, discouraged, depressed guy. No man cares for my soul. He was bowed down. On the outside, it looked like he was standing up. But on the inside, under so much pain and calamity, he was bent over. We come many times to the altar with expectation. We come to the man of God to seek relief. It doesn't come. You come back week after week looking for relief, but it just doesn't seem to come. And you cry as did David, quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteous sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. That's what God wants to do. Abraham was promised to be the father of a nation, but he had to wait. David was given the throne, but another man was still on him. Joseph was promised a palace, but there was the pit, there was a prison, or Potiphar, and then there was a prison. Joy is promised in the morning, but we're, many of us are still going through a night of weeping. Weapons don't prosper, but they're aimed at your direction. Have you know what I'm talking about? The Hebrew word fixed is kun, which means to erect. Don't bow to the enemy. Don't bow to the pressure. Don't bow to the temptations to cave in. Stand erect. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed, oh God. I will